private assets have risk. The question is, how do you mitigate the risk? How do you deal with that risk? So first you identify, then you mitigate, and hopefully then you avoid. And we want to look at four different ways that that's possible to get that done. First, diversify. Second, manage your costs. Evergreen approach, which I'll explain in a minute, and waterfalls, which probably doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but it will. So let's just first talk about fees. In a typical private equity fund, when we started investing for clients in this, this is what it looked like. They wanted 2% on committed capital. Now the question is, what is committed capital? You go in and commit a million dollars to a private equity fund. They say, okay, thanks. We're raising a $200 million fund. You're one of the investors. They'll ask you for 200,000 now, but you are committed to another 800,000 whenever they want it in the next five years. When they charge 2% on committed capital, it means they're charging 2% on your million. They're not charging 2% on your 200,000. Your other 800,000 is sitting in the bank earning 1% interest. So they're actually charging you in that first year 10% on the money they've actively got invested, not two. So if 80% of the committed funds were invested over a period of five years, the average fee would be somewhere between five and 7% a year. And then they have performance fees of 20% once they get over an 8% rate of return. But a new model for private equity is starting to come out. Partners Group and uh, Northern Private Capital are two examples of this, and we have a relationship with both of them. And their model is really a lot different. So for starters, they only charge 1.5% and only on the money you actually invest with them. They give you co-invest opportunities, which means they bring investments to you that you can invest in directly as opposed to through the fund that they've created. And the fees on that are much lower. So in the case of our relationship with Northern Private Capital, our current fees are about three quarters of 1% a year. And the performance fees are also lower. In fact, the total fees for the first five years will be at least 75% less than they would with a traditional two and 20 model. So managing fees is doable. Now to diversify, you need a multiplicity of managers. You need different vintages, meaning different funds starting at different uh, years. You need geographical dispersion, industrial dispersion, and most importantly, diversification amongst asset classes. So equity, debt, infrastructure, and real estate. They're all private assets. So in our current private equity fund, we have $275 million of assets, 21 funds, 12 managers, global companies, and 14 direct co-invests. So our objective is to get to a point where we have maybe 60% of the fund direct or in co-invest with our partners that we work with. Now the next thing is about closed-end versus evergreen funds. Almost all private equity funds are closed-end, so this is what that means. They raise 100, 500 million, whatever they've decided for the vintage they're in now, and they require a significant minimum investment. There are some smaller funds that will let you put in as little as 250,000, but usually it's between one to five million as a minimum investment or commitment. When you make that, you're gonna fund it over five years, but the fund is gonna run 10 to 14 years. You'll get liquidity, but only when they sell assets. The investor is responsible for what's called dry powder. So when you hear these words, there's so much dry powder in real estate, all that really means is that investors have agreed to commit more money to an existing fund already but they're sitting on it, which means they're typically sitting it on it in bonds and T-bills earning, as we've seen, ridiculously low interest rates. Now, an evergreen fund is different. First off, it has small minimums. Uh, there's no other capital commitment. So you make an investment, and if you choose to leave it at that level, it stays there. There's a one to three year minimum hold period, not 10 to 14 years. Typically, liquidity is available on a monthly, quarterly, or at worst, annual basis. And you can add new capital when it's available. In other words, if you want to add more capital, it's like dollar cost averaging, you can bring it in a year, two years, five years later. When we talk about waterfalls, waterfalls are an interesting way to reduce risk, um, especially when you're dealing with uh, a multiplicity of funds. So this is what it looks like. If you invest in one fund, this fund is gonna take five years to invest the capital and another five to seven years to basically pay it back by selling the companies they've invested in. So 
you have a lot more risk with one fund. But if you were to continue to do it, what would happen is you would end up with a series of things that look like a waterfall. Now, initially, you're investing money, but you're not getting any cash back. But it doesn't take that many years before you get fairly diversified, so your cash income from your original investments is starting to make a material difference. And ultimately, you get to the point where you have really high diversification amongst a multiplicity of investments, and you're getting cash flow on a regular, ongoing basis as well. So the objective we have is to get to that last stage. Right now, we're in the middle stage. Co-investments are a way to get really good rates and also choose the investments you want to be in. So recently, Northern Private Capital announced that they were buying McDonald Detweiler from Maxar Technologies for a billion dollars. Most of this acquisition was done by them approaching their partners and asking them to invest directly, including us. Highland Capital bought a company called Bid about three years ago, and the only people that invested in it were investing directly. These co-invests have much lower fees than traditional funds, and we get to review each investment for suitability, and we decide how much we actually want to put into each investment as well. So when we take a look at the uh, asset markets, we shouldn't forget there's another side to equity, which is debt. So right now in the US, roughly speaking, there's about $3.4 trillion in private equity, but almost $800 billion in private debt. And private debt is different than private equity in a lot of ways. First off, it's less risk. It has lower returns, of course, as bonds do against typically equities. Uh, shorter duration, which means the money is not tied up nearly as long. And it generates current income almost immediately. And in our case, we've designed it such a way that it's eligible to be owned by RSP or TFSAs or foundations where it's not the interest income that's generated by it is not taxable. 